All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to be continuing Descartes' second meditation uh, with the third and last section. Hopefully we get through this in one video, but it may end up splitting over two, like the middle section um, of this meditation did. Uh, so this is where Descartes presents what's known as the wax argument. So the wax argument is kind of uh, him using a ball of wax to represent the way that we perceive the physical world. Um, and what he ends up uh, coming to the conclusion of is that um, we don't actually know the physical world or we don't have knowledge of it or understand it through our senses. It's not from what we see or hear or touch or smell or taste. It's from what he refers to as mental scrutiny. In other words, it, it's in the way that we think about it. And if we link this back to the last section, remember we primarily exist as thinking things. So it makes sense that we would understand our world around us through thinking. So before we start with the reading, just a reminder of where we left off. Um, at the end, Descartes uh, has reached the conclusion that the I which exists in uh, his cogito argument, I think therefore I am, um, must exist as a thinking thing. Uh, this, he argues, is not undermined by the doubtfulness of the senses because we don't perceive our thoughts with the senses. Remember, our thoughts aren't corporeal things. They don't have extension or weight or color, anything like that. It's not undermined by the dream argument because even if we are dreaming, it means the content of our thoughts are false, but that we are thinking is not false. And it's not undermined by the evil deceiver because even if we are being deceived, we're not being deceived that we are thinking. We might be being deceived in what we are thinking, but not that we are thinking. Uh, so at the end of this section, um, Descartes sort of comes to a troubling uh, problem, and that is that he feels like he know, still knows his body and the corporeal world better than he knows the mental one. Uh, and so this is where we pick up um, in the reading. Uh, he is now going to um, essentially embark on allowing his mind to treat the physical world as if it is real. Um, so the way that we would commonly perceive the world, most of us never think about the world around us as not being physical. Um, so he's going to treat this physical world as if it is real. He's going to use a specific example that is a ball of wax. And he's going to, through that, show that, well, actually we don't perceive the physical world through our senses we actually perceive it through our thoughts, which sounds odd now, but will make sense in a moment. So take out your reading books. Um, you should be looking at a page that has a little 20 in the top left-hand corner. We're going to be going from the second paragraph on that page, which starts with, let us continue the things which people commonly think they understand. Um, so highlighters and pens at the ready. Um, and... Uh, here we go. Let's begin with the wax argument. So, let us consider the things which people commonly think they understand most distinctly of all. So, these are the things that we think we have the most clarity of. That is, the bodies which we touch and see. I do not mean bodies in general, for general perceptions are apt to be somewhat more confused. So, he's not taking like a big picture approach to this, like the entire physical universe. Instead, he's going to narrow it down onto one object, um, as he says now, but one particular body. Uh, let us take, for example, this piece of wax. Um, so imagine yourself quite literally holding a little ball of wax while we're going through this. It'll help you to understand and kind of picture what Descartes is going for. It has just been taken from the honeycomb. It has not yet quite lost the taste of the honey. It retains some of the scent of the flowers from which it was gathered. Its color, shape, and size are plain to see. It is hard, cold, and can be handled without difficulty. If you wrap it or knock on it with your knuckle, it makes a sound. So here Descartes is obviously engaging all of our senses. When we engage with the ball of wax, you know, we can lick it and taste the honeycomb because um, it's been freshly taken from the honeycomb, as he says. Uh, it still has the scent of the flowers from which it was gathered. Um, so he's trying to show our basic perception of the world as we would normally have it, which is, well, I interact with my world through my senses. What he's going to show is that, well, that may not actually be the case. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so 
In short, it has everything which appears necessary to enable a body to be known as distinctly as possible. So remember, distinct, clear, as clearly as possible. But even as I speak, I put the wax by the fire, and look, the residual taste is eliminated. So he's actually melting the wax a little bit here. Um, he tastes it again, and that honeycomb taste is gone. It becomes liquid and hot. You can hardly touch it, and if you strike it, or knock on it with your knuckles again, it no longer makes a sound. But does the wax still remain? It must be admitted that it does. No one denies it. No one thinks otherwise. So what was it in the wax that I understood with such distinctness? So what he's pointing out here is that if we take something as simple as a ball of wax and you look at it, you know, you can engage all of your senses with it and you would say, well, that's wax. But if I then place it next to a fire, it's going to melt, it's going to turn to liquid, the smell will change, the taste will change, the color will change, uh, even right down to the consistency. It won't be a solid anymore, it'll be a liquid. And yet if I asked you what it was, you would say, well, that's wax. Now, what Descartes pointing out here is if we can fundamentally change the physical aspects of something, like every single physical aspect of something, then obviously it can't be those physical aspects because something can't be both solid and liquid and be the same thing um, if we only understood the world from a physical point of view. Because if we say, well, wax is solid, well, then as soon as it's liquid, it's no longer wax. If we say that wax is both a solid and a liquid, well, this seems tricky because, well, which one is its real state? Which one is the wax and which one is the adjustment of the wax? Um, it's very hard to say. So this is the point that Descartes making. If it was totally reliant on the senses, um, then it wouldn't be able to take such various forms. Otherwise, how could we possibly understand that the hard ball of wax is the same as the sort of liquid puddle of wax that we've got now. Um, so, what was it in the wax that I understood with such distinctness? Evidently, none of the features which I arrived at by means of the senses, for whatever came under taste, smell, sight, touch, or hearing, has now altered, yet the wax remains. So he's pointing out that even though we've changed everything that we physically measure about the wax, the notion of or our understanding of the wax has remained. Perhaps the answer lies in the thought which now comes to my mind, namely, the wax was not after all the sweetness of the honey, uh, sorry, the wax was not after all the sweetness of the honey or the fragrance of the flowers or the whiteness or the shape or the sound, but was rather a body which persist, uh, presented itself to me in these various forms a little while ago, but which now exhibits a different one. Um, so what he's saying here is that um, things are not their physical properties. So wax is not uh, the sweetness of the honey. Wax is not the fragrance of the flowers. Wax is not the whiteness or the shape or the sound. Um, the notion of wax is something else. We then attribute all of these things to the notion of wax, but all of those things can change without changing what we understand wax to be. Um, but what exactly is it that I am now imagining? Let us concentrate, take away everything which does not belong to the wax, and see what is left. Um, so basically what he's saying here, let's take away all of this stuff that can possibly change. What are we left with if we have something that we say is not going to change of the wax? Um, and so uh, he says, uh, what is left? Merely something extended, flexible, and changeable. Uh, so he's kind of giving us a broader definition of wax. Something that is extended, it extends into the physical world. It's flexible, so we can move it and shift it. And it's changeable, it changes its form from solid to liquid. Uh, but what is meant here by flexible and changeable? It is what I picture in my imagination, that this piece of wax... Uh, sorry, is it what I picture in my imagination, that this piece of wax is capable of changing from a round shape to a square shape, or from a square shape to a triangular shape? Not at all, for I can grasp that the wax is capable of countless changes of this kind. Yet I am unable to run through this immeasurable number of changes in my imagination, which 
uh, from which it follows that it is not the faculty of imagination that gives me my grasp of the wax as flexible and changeable. So what Descartes is pointing out here is, is it possible that the wax simply exists as an illusion that is created in my imagination? In other words, am I just imagining that I'm holding a ball of wax uh, in my hand right now? What he points out is, well, that would be fine if the wax could only take shapes that I'm able to imagine. So I can imagine a square and I can imagine a triangle. So if wax only took the shape of things which I can imagine, I have the ability to imagine, then we might be able to say that it only exists in our imagination. The problem with that is that wax can take uh, unimaginable shapes. So if you think about softening a piece of wax and then you throw it against the ground, it I mean, who knows what kind of shape it's going to take? Who knows where it will have divots and where it won't and how spread out it'll get? And um, yeah, Really, we have no idea. The you know, It's innumerable, the number of uh, forms or the number of shapes that the wax could make. And so because of this, it, it can't possibly be coming from my imagination because it actually exceeds my imagination. Um, I can imagine a square, but a piece of wax can take forms well beyond a square uh, and well beyond what I'm able to imagine. Um, uh, so, and what is meant by extended? Is the extension of the wax also unknown? For it increases if the wax melts, increases again if it boils, and is greater still if the heat is increased. I would not be making a correct judgment about the nature of wax unless I believed it capable of being extended in many more different ways than I will ever encompass in my imagination. I must therefore admit that the nature of this piece of wax is in no way revealed by my imagination, but is perceived by my mind alone. Um, so what he's pointing out here again is this issue of, well, if the form that it takes can change in ways that I can't imagine, the extension of it changes in ways I can't imagine as well. Whilst the ball will take up one uh, amount of physical space, when it's liquefied, it takes up more physical space. The warmer things get, the more they expand. And so, well, how much space does the wax take? Well, it really depends what form it's in. Um, and so this is the difficulty of it. Um, and he's saying that, uh, you know, um, the, the nature of this piece of wax is in no way revealed by my imagination. So he, his imagination is not creating the ball of wax, but instead it is perceived by the mind alone. Um, so he's saying that, you know, understanding of this wax actually starts in the mind, not imagination, not the senses, but in the mind. Uh, continuing on, I am speaking of this particular piece of wax. The point is even clearer with regard to wax in general. But uh, what? <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. But what is this wax which is perceived by my mind alone? Is it? It is, of course, the same wax which I see, which I touch, which I picture in my imagination. In short, the same wax which I thought it to be from the start. And yet, here is the point: the perception. Uh, Sorry, I just lost my uh, marker there. The perception I have of it is a case not of vision or touch or imagination, nor has it ever been, despite pe previous appearances, but of purely mental scrutiny. So here's the introduction of this very important idea of mental scrutiny. Um, and this can be imperfect and confused as it was before, or clear and distinct as it is now, depending on how carefully I concentrate on what the wax consists in. So what is... He's sort of summing up the first part of his argument here that, well, how does he know the wax? It's not through the senses because they, they, the sense data of the wax changes. You know, it's hard and then it's soft. It's, uh, it smells one way, then it smells another. That all changes. It can't be in his imagination because it it's, exceeds the capabilities of his imagination. How must he understand the wax? By thinking about the wax through mental scrutiny or thought alone. That must be how understanding of the wax um, exists, and that must be how it is revealed to him. That can be very clear and distinct, or it can be sort of muddy, um, but a little bit like what we talked about before. The content might be difficult, but that he is thinking is indoubtable. Um, all right, we'll stop there for this recording, because we're almost out of time. Um, we'll be picking up from the next paragraph uh, in the next recording.